session two, operating in crisis and, and uncertainty. My name is Lieutenant Colonel Langishart, and I'll be chairing uh, this panel session. Three guests today, all coming in uh, virtual. And our first guest is Mr. Hugh Jennings. Uh, following an early career as a teacher and a football coach, uh, teaching at the district, county and regional levels throughout Oxfordshire, he moved on to Oxford United Centre of Excellence, which start, started his career thereafter in, uh, in mainstream and premiership football. 1998, Hugh joined Southampton Football Club as the head of education there, and then took over as director of the academy in 2001. In 2006, Hugh joined the Premier League as its youth development manager before um, answering his call in to come back to club rugby, where he joined Fulham Football Club to take over their uh, academy, rejuvenate their academy. Under his stewardship over the last 10 plus years, he's taken it from where it was back then to where it is now, one of the leading uh, academies for youth football in the country. In the summer of 2019, Hugh, Hugh was recognized for his contribution to football by being awarded a doctorate of sport by Southampton Solent University. Hugh's talk today is entitled, Not the New Normal. Hugh, over to you, welcome. Thanks very much Langley for that introduction and welcome everybody to this session. Uh, I'm really privileged to be here today and on what's a beautiful day outside and a very curious one in the US uh, to have a chance to spend an hour with you uh, in such a fantastic company uh, will be a privilege. I hope not to kill you with uh, too much by the way of PowerPoint, but there are a couple of reference points I'd, I'd just like to refer to. And as Langley has uh, already mentioned, I just uh, share my screen now, which hopefully will come through in just a moment. There we go. So hopefully you're seeing uh, me in what um, I've not been used to before, which is some form of academic dress. I've never had a great academic career, but uh, there I am with some curious pipe, it seems, um, at, at the end of the scroll. This was a special day for myself, and my family to be awarded an honorary doctorate. Um, but I was taken down a peg or two by the August Bob Reeves, who told me he's got he's got a, a bookcase full of these guys. But back to the day job, and as has been introduced, mine has been an academy manager um, for in excess of 20 years. And combining that with what I imagine military training might be from time to time is uh, doing a little bit of uh, outdoor activity. So here I am at the top of the precipice, looking relatively calm. Um, a little bit uh, concerned about whether or not my, uh, my fellow officers are looking after me properly. Um, but assuming they are, then the rope will be secure. Um, just before the descent, you'll notice though that typical anxiety before perhaps we come out of the dressing room, that is the top of the cliff. Well, the life of the academy manager requires teammates alongside you. And there's da Darren Saal, who at that time was, a, was at Watford, now at Yeovil. Of course, a, a, a famous location for the military. And halfway down where they're picking up our, uh, uh, our balls and battens and flags to collect and win our prize at the bottom, where I'm joined by colleagues Nigel and Steve from uh, Norwich and Swansea, respectively. The band of football brothers honour perhaps amongst thieves. The life of an academy manager that doesn't, in this case, involve any football. But what indeed that leadership has helped me to appreciate and to understand is that when you come into a crisis such as the one we've had, is how you see those who can rise from the disappointment they face to really do good. Here is young Jay Stansfield, who uh, perhaps not in military terms, covering that much ground, but for a young football athlete, to get, dedicate himself to his personal training, having just played for our first team at the tender age of 17, to get back home and dedicate himself to the work of others by supporting the NHS. So how did we set about the principles of trying to support our players and our team of staff during this challenging and unprecedented period? Well, we came up with the three C's of care, communication, and consistency. And for us, care was to be aware of individual needs, not just indeed of the players, but also of our staff. 
And in terms of consistency, to give the structure and clarity to support staff and players, to give them a purpose and an understanding. And to ensure that our communication and listening to the part of the previous session, absolutely a classic message to build a community that ensured that we stuck together. And surely that is one of the leading facets of communication, the capacity to stick together in whatever unit, a military unit, a team unit, a colleague unit, a family unit. For us then, academy to the first team, academy to the club, and club to our supporters. I was privileged to speak to many of our um, older supporters, some of whom based in my location in Farnham, and to hear their wonderful stories of their support for Fulham, in many cases in excess of, of 50 years. It was a, a privilege to have that time to spend with them, which ordinarily we wouldn't have, and a moment to be set in time as something to hold on to during this difficult period. But it isn't just about a top line and how you might operate, but it's actually having a plan. A plan to, in our case, define, direct, to be active, to review, and to move to the next steps. In our case, this was some of the stuff that we, we engineered. Being active, for example, was to have lots of structure, which typically young footballers aspire to and need in their lives, to have a schedule to be regular with our meetings and to focus on the support, not only of their physical needs, but also of their mental health and well-being needs. Simple things like quizzes and bake-offs and question and answers with first team players, all designed to engage and support and to ensure they felt as though this wasn't the end of their worlds. To provide understanding and critical thinking as well, to stimulate and to ensure that our young players were feeling as though this period of isolation, they weren't on their own and they were learning and they were continuing to develop and to move forward. And for us to prepare particularly the next steps for the re-engagement with our players to plan for their return to training, which in our case came in August. So where are we now as we look towards this uh, second lockdown and what it might entail? Well, when we get back to normal, is the title for this brief vignette, but I would urge you to consider there is no normal. There's no new normal either. There is just new. We're all for, forever blowing bubbles, not in the West Ham style, but ensuring that we stay protected, we stay safe. We've been categorized as elite sport at academy level, and we'll be entitled to continue to train, prepare and play during the next lockdown period, which is a tribute to the way in which we've managed to keep COVID at bay in our environments, all by protecting each other. It's testing for sure. We're not in a tested bubble in the academy. We don't think that that's the right approach. Football needs to be cognizant of the needs of our communities. The NHS, nurses and doctors are more important than us. And is it all about tears or tears? Well, as we move into one tier during lockdown, we still have to prepare for the fact that we need to protect the areas around us to lower the rate of infection. And that will ensure that the tears will be hopefully of happiness and, not of, joy, uh, and of joy, not of disappointment. Football is rightly ridiculed at times and challenged over the culture of money, money, money. They said it's a rich man's world, but not now. And we have to support each other lower down in the football pyramid. I'm frustrated and disappointed that we can't seem to find a way through at this difficult time. But throughout, we have to stay positive, show resilience and deal with disappointment. And at Fulham, that's exactly what our plan has been. So as I just come off the sharing of the screen and just before handing back to you Langley to say, Thank you for your time. I'm looking forward to answering your questions. And I think to conclude by saying that youth sport is something that we can easily consider to pass over the importance of this time. But let me urge you by encouraging all of you who are parents and all of you who are involved in working with young people, nothing stimulates the brain more than having the opportunity for exercise and for competition 
and for moving forward collectively in a team unity. Thank you. Hugh, thank you very much and great to see you again. And um, as expected, some consistent themes there and it's good to see um, knowing your people through care, communication and consistency as well. Um, and, and we'll no doubt come back to revisit some of those. Um, Hugh, thank you. Our next guest then is Major General Felix Gedney. Very much a combat officer, General Felix compliments this with a breadth of experience across strategy, logistics, and senior management as well. He's got an extensive overseas portfolio, including working with partners and allies in Afghanistan and the Middle East, as well as dealing with war and fractions in the Balkans. Most of his last seven years have been working with our um, key strategic ally in the US Army, most recently as Deputy Commander of Coalition Forces in Iraq and Syria, dealing with the ISIS problem. So a man who definitely understands chaos and, uh, and uncertainty. As well as working in the uh, deplorable field army, he's also seen appointments in the Ministry of Defense, the Army Headquarters, the US Pentagon, and the United Nations Headquarters in New York. Never one to shy from a challenge, he's swum the channel, motorcycled across the Hindu Kush, and played elephant polo, so quite a bucket list there. Here today to talk about the military approach to operating in crisis. Ladies and gentlemen, Major General Felix Gedney. General. Hey, thanks. Thanks, Langley. Um, I hope you can uh, hear me okay. Um, I'd like to thank the Foundation for Leadership Through Sport and the Centre for Army Leadership for setting this up. And to all of those who've joined virtually, and also say what a great honour it is to be included on the panel with uh, Hugh and with, with Eddie. I'm going to talk about the military approach to operating in chaos and uncertainty. Uh, and as I do so, I'd like to commend those documents that um, Langley mentioned earlier from the Centre of Army Leadership about leading through crisis. Now, the cow found me because I've been involved to a small extent on um, the COVID response, both at the Army's Home Command, taking command at short notice, and also part of their work with the NHS. However, I'm going to offer a more personal view based on 34 years of military experience, a significant proportion of which, as Langley says, has been leading on military operations around the world, uh, most often within a chaotic and uncertain environment. I'm going to talk about what I think is required, how the military try to achieve this, and then what, what this means for leaders. So start with what's required. In order to navigate a successful path through a crisis, which in most cases means finding the least bad outcome, we need a number of things. We need a clear aim, and Lizzie alluded to this earlier, which is understood and known by everyone. We need a plan. And then most importantly, we need a team to deliver that aim using that plan or amendment of it as the crisis evolves. Now in the army and the military, we achieve this by first providing a vision through the chaos and uncertainty with a clear statement and understanding of the aim. This provides clarity of purpose to all of those that are involved. Indeed, the first principle of war that's taught to cadets at the Royal Military Academy Sandhurst is in fact selection and maintenance of the aim. Secondly, we come up with a plan. And in order to develop a plan, the army trains its leaders in various planning tools. Again, as Lizzie mentioned earlier. And these enable leaders to take a systematic, logical approach to assess the context and the situation Consider all the relevant factors, weigh up the benefits and risks to come up with a viable plan. But at the same time, we also train our leaders to make rapid decisions and act quickly if there is no time for that detailed planning. And the first part of any planning process is the time estimate to answer that critical question of how long have I got? Third, we work to ensure that everyone understands the aim and the plan. And really importantly, they understand why we are taking that approach. And this is achieved through communication and to some extent, the ability of leaders to inspire those that they're leading 
and get them bought into the plan. It's an old axiom, but when you're telling someone what to do or telling them to do something, start with why and not what. Fourth, we try not to get distracted, overawed, or intimidated by the shock, chaos, and uncertainty that a crisis, a crisis causes. The army expends a significant effort in developing leaders who can operate and think and act clearly in a stressful and chaotic environment. Now we do this in places like the Royal Military Academy by injecting friction into the training. This includes fatigue, sleep deprivation, information overload, physical hardship, and at times fear. And by doing this, we develop individuals with the ability to think and act effectively in combat, which I would argue is perhaps the ultimate crisis. Finally, we build teams. I would describe a team as a diverse group of mutually trusting and understanding people with shared values and a shared aim. A diverse group of mutually trusting and understanding people with shared values and a shared aim. And I'd like to highlight a few points from that definition. The first is of shared values, and it's our values that underpin the team. All of those within the British Army have a very clear understanding of our organization's values. And this is the essential building block, the bedrock of our teams. It sets the organization's culture and it fosters trust. And, and you heard Lizzie talk about how quickly she was able to rapidly build the team from 102 Brigade. Uh, and she was able to do that because she's drawing on some people with shared values who understand those values. And as an aside, my start point, if I deal with anyone in the military, is an absolute trust in their, in their judgment and ability. Now, sometimes um, I'm allayed of those thoughts after a while, but uh, not very often. Second thing I'd highlight is a need for mutual understanding. This does not mean that all the team have to agree. Indeed, challenge and constructive dissent is essential in any healthy team in order to ensure everyone has a voice and the collective intellectual horsepower is harnessed. This avoids any potential groupthink or any assumption that the senior person always has the best ideas. Believe me, we don't. Finally, diversity. It's also critical as diversity widens the scope and aperture and capability of the team. Without diversity, a team is a clique. Now, clearly it's better to go into a crisis with a strong team than it is to try and build one on the hoof while you're also managing the chaos and uncertainty, but it is never too late. So what does this mean for the leader? Well, the leader has to provide the clarity of purpose to the team. The leader must have confidence and courage to, as the Cowles booklet puts it so well, step back from the fog, keep their heads up, see the big picture and make good decisions. They have to be able to focus on the aim, the plan and the team rather than their own personal challenges. The leader must communicate clearly and effectively. Now, those first three to varying degrees can be delegated. There are certain things though that the only the leader can do. And those are to inspire, persuade, encourage the team whilst having the humility to listen and the ability to change track when necessary. And the leader must also foster and build the team, reinforcing the shared values, encouraging diverse views and that constructive challenge. So finally, this is all because leadership, as Frank so well put in the previous panel, is about people. And this is especially true during crisis and especially true as we look at how we use the virtual tools and work remotely with our people. Leaders have to be able to connect with their people and have empathy with them, as well as sufficient self-awareness and resilience to manage themselves. Uh, and resilience in itself is a, is a subject which is far too deep to get into, but I'm very happy to go into that in Q&A. 
because the leader's role is about serving the people that they are leading and enabling them as a team to navigate that path through crisis, which is why the motto of the Royal Military Academy at Sandhurst is indeed serve to lead, which is a pretty uh, neat place for me to uh, hand back to Langley. General, thank you very much indeed. And again, a lot of consistent themes um, and uh, good to see that um, you, you've uh, recognised some of the work that Cal's done and that it that aligns with your thinking. That's really, really encouraging, given the, the breadth of experience that you've got. And, um, and we will come back to some of those themes in, in the questions as well. So, General, thanks very much. Our final guest then, before we hit the Q&As, well, if you've been in, living in on, on planet Mars, um, you probably don't need to be introduced to our, our, our next speaker. Everyone should know who he is fresh off the back of uh, a third Six Nations Championship victory, head coach of England Rugby, Mr. Eddie Jones. Uh, Eddie started his early career as a professional rugby player himself uh, in his home country of Australia, as well as a short spell in 1991 with uh, Leicester before retiring and moving into the world of teaching, um, uh, where he finishes as a school principal before coming back into rugby, where he coached the Australian team. Uh, there he had famous wins over British and Irish Lions in 2001 and led the national team to Tri-Nations victory in his first season in charge. In 2007, Eddie was part of the coaching team for South Africa when they won the World Cup there before moving across to Japan to lead their famous victory against the Springboks in 2015. Also in 2015 then, Eddie came across to, to the UK, to England, where he was assigned as the first foreign coach of the England team. And he's a man, a man has been credited as leading the re uh, renaissance in English rugby that has transformed the team to record equal, equal in highs. Three years ago, he was named Rugby World Co uh, Coach of the Year and later led England through to the World Cup final, uh, albeit being, uh, uh, beating the All Blacks on the way. His finest hour, of course, was coming runner-up in the World Cup final of 2003, losing to the better team on the day. Here to share his experience on planning to overcome uncertainty, ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Eddie Jones. The uncertainty around the organisation of the game over the last 12 months, we've had two games cancelled, uh, France in the World Cup and Barbarians a couple of weeks ago. And there's a simple little checklist we use to, to try to get ourselves back on the front foot because you obviously lose some motivation, you lose all the emotional uh, work that you put into the game, the physical work. So we try to work out quickly what we can control, what we can't control. Uh, where is the biggest opportunity for us? Um, try to do it with speed because I think the big thing people want is, is certainty when there's uncertainty. Um, so we try to do it as quickly as we can. Uh, the cycle of pre-briefing the key, key people uh, observing their behaviour and then debriefing them is very important during any time of uncertainty. And the last thing for the leader is to make sure that he's walking, walking the floor, so to speak. So you're out there observing everything that's going on. Um, so you're seeing everything firsthand. The second part, the uncertainty in the game, I've got no idea. Um, I see teams, I watch the NRL grand final last week. So probably one of the most experienced teams in the competition with the most experienced captain, one of the best players of all time, lead 26-6 with 20 minutes to go, playing absolutely magnificent football, uh, focused, driven, and then they start being seduced by the scoreboard, start playing loose, and they can't, they can't get their game back. And we had the same with Italy on on. Saturday night, you know, the first 20 minutes we're playing brilliantly. We drop one ball, um, a bit of uncertainty comes into our game and we're working really hard on trying to un understand that cycle of within the game where you're getting those uncertain moments. We talk about momentum and vulnerability, but we still haven't worked it out um, of how when you've got momentum to keep momentum and, and also understand that that time you're at your most vulnerable. And how can you plan, how can you firstly anticipate and then plan for that almost inevitability that's going to happen at some stage? So that's something we're looking at all the time. So I can't give you any answers there. So anyone's got any answers for me, I'm looking forward to the Q&A. So Langley, that's about all I've got to say, mate. I'm so impressed by listening to Hugh and uh, 
Felix, I want to listen to them in the Q&A. Eddie, thanks very much uh, indeed. And if I could keep you um, on, online there, Eddie, and come to you first, and just draw out um, something you mentioned there about uncertainty, um, focusing on the France game, the Barbars. There's a question that came through early on as well. How do you, how do you keep a positive mindset and maintain motivation amongst the team when they, uh, when they face such uncertainty? They all geared up for the Barbars game, right at the last minute, it's turned off. How do you, how do you ma ma maintain that momentum and focus? I think the, the planning quickly is the most important thing, really looking ahead. What can we get out of the next period of time? So, for instance, with the Bar Bar game, we uh, quickly organised a session for Saturday between ourselves, had a sort of like a Champions League Cup draw, made a bit of fun, had two teams. They had to organise their game plan and set up the game the next day. So they had something to look forward to. And similarly, when we got the France game, we went down to our training base in Miyazaki. By the time the hurricane set, we were down in Miyazaki and had a fantastic training run and, and, and was then looking forward to the next game. So you've got to give some, something to the people to look forward to immediately. Thanks, Eddie. Chu, could I, could I come to you with the same question? Um, given the, the, the spectrum of uh, talent you've got there in the, the academy, all different ages, going through different stages of their lives and uh, different pressures, um, both in terms of their focus on their football careers, but also home life, school, etc. How do you best maintain and sustain motivation um, and purpose through crisis? It's fascinating to see when uh, the thing they love was taken away from them on the 16th of March, coincidentally my wife's birthday, so I'm blaming her, that... Um, you had the whole spectrum of reactions. And by the way, that was from staff members as well. And I'm sure through professional sport, we'll have all have seen a number of colleagues who've really struggled with dealing with the uncertainty of this period. But I think what you've got to do is you've got to galvanise people to be able to deal with disappointment. We preach a gospel of dealing with disappointment on the pitch. So now it's a question of dealing with disappointment off the pitch. And you've got to find a trigger point with each individual what is it that enables them to, uh, to find their sweet spot to move forward? Now, the other added element for us, which is a particular challenge, was the personal circumstances of a number of our players. For those living in the sort of stockbroker Surrey belt with, um, from, from, from relatively privileged backgrounds, uh, it was easy for them to get outside and uh, out in the garden. But we've got a number of youngsters who are in inner London in uh, apartment blocks where there's no garden, there's no open space. And for them, it was particularly challenging. How can we connect with them? Typically, a few things that we did is we had personal calls from first team players into them to try and ensure that they felt better about themselves. And we also had, and we're not ashamed to, to, offer, uh, to offer out, if you like, the opportunity for them to say, we're really struggling with some of the basics. We can't get to the shops to get food in. Um, our son needs better nutrition um, for his lifestyle as a, as a leading athlete. So really targeting the individual is a big message from us. That's great, uh, Hugh. Thanks very much. And it boils back to that same point again. It's all about people knowing your people and looking after. I really, I really admire what you, you've done there in terms of linking the, the uh, sort of professional athletes with, their, with the younger guys and girls coming up through the academy, inspiring to be them. And bridging that gap is really, really important. Yeah. Uh, General, I wonder if I could throw the same question over to you. Um, it's something I guess the military is familiar with. How, how do you motivate? Can I, but, uh, but, I, but, I'm, um, but I think you've just said it. I think it's about knowing your people. I think knowing your people, know their circumstances, understand what makes them tick. Um, so as Hugh said, find that trigger point. You know, and we know this from, from dealing with, with soldiers at every level, uh, just making sure you, you know and understand your people really well. And that's particularly important when you're remote, you know, you have to keep that contact and that individual contact. When you can't go face to face, you've got to find ways of making those connections and understanding them. With principles guiding us and values and morals guiding us as well, how do you ensure that all your people are aligned to what good delivery of principles, values and morals are? How do we ensure alignment, alignment of these? General, I wonder if I could come to you, you first, given you, you, you talked about it in your brief. Yeah, absolutely. Andy. So I think two things. First of all, uh, uh, reinforcing those values with clear statements of them. Um, it's always good when you hear leaders absolutely verbalizing what those values are. And the second thing is um, 
uh, basically setting an example, living those values, wherever you are in the, in the organization, um, you know, those leadership positions bring responsibilities to be more rigid than ever to your organization's values. And, and we all know, we've seen in every organization where leaders think that they don't have to apply those values because they don't apply to them anymore. They apply more the higher you up in any organization because you have to demonstrate um, and be the example because that sets the tone and culture within your organization. Thanks, General. Eddie, can I come to you on that? Um, how, do you, how do you sustain values and, and cohere values across um, English rugby and across the team? No, it's been interesting. With the previous team, I coach Japan, we, were, we, were, we imposed values on the team. We went back and looked at, at, at samurai culture and imposed values of respect, loyalty and hard work and get, didn't give the players a choice. When I came to England, yeah, it's, it's about the different cultures. I found the England, English like to be organised, but they don't like to be told. Um, so rather than say, this is what England rugby is going to be about, all I said, this is how we're going to play the game to win. Um, and from that has grown some values that the players have, have come up with themselves. So they own the values. What we try to do then is, is reinforce those values all the time, uh, reward the values all the time, and just make it something that you prioritise. And as soon as you prioritise something, they, it tends to be important. Thanks, Now I'm going to come back to some of the uh, cross-cultural uh, leadership piece there as well for, for all three uh, panellists, if I may. But if I could just finish off on that question with you, Hugh, um, I guess nurturing uh, young talent through the academy system, an element of that is, 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 is instilling values into them. Is that right? And how do you do that? How do you reward well, I think it's about growing values as as you support the young players growing both uh, personally and, and professionally. Um, but one thing I'd like to highlight here is that when I joined Fulham almost 12 years ago, it was already a value centric club and that sustained us in the tough times. And more recently in the academy, we've adopted academy specific values. Hard work and honesty are two easy ones, if you like, to associate with. But in professional sport, to associate with humility, one of our three H's. We think that's pivotal and we think that's one of the reasons we've been able to be successful as, uh, as a production line of talent because for us it's about trying to ensure that each individual understands how they should act and interact and preaching a gospel of hum humility I think really really helps with that and frankly that, that has to come from the leader, leader down. Uh, it's the only thing I'd insist from the leader down frankly. You know, nearly everything else uh, that, that I deliver is given to me by my excellent team, um, both of, of staff and, and players. But demonstrating humility at this critical period is, uh, is pivotal. Thanks, Hugh. Um, music to my ears. I think whenever you look at uh, bad leadership, whenever you come across examples of that, one of the classic missing ingredients is humility every single time. So I'm, I'm really glad you brought that out. Um, and if I could just come back to a point you brought out there, Eddie, and that's the cross-cultural leadership and the difficulties of cross-cultural leadership. And as I look at all your resumes, I notice that you've all got um, a, a lot of experience in this, in this field. Whether Eddie, from you, you know, coaching in Australia, South Africa, Japan, uh, and now in England, general, clearly working with partners and allies from all over the world. And you um, dealing with uh, different people from different backgrounds, different nationalities, different generations indeed. Um, how difficult is cross-cultural leadership? We, 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 we talk about it as such a, a critical element um, in this day and age, particularly in crisis, embracing diversity and bringing talents out of, of everyone, regardless of their background, cultures, traditions, values. So how difficult is it to lead uh, cross-culturally? Have you got any top tips for our audience today? If I could start with well, that with, uh, with you, Eddie. Yeah, I will just on the first part, just the diversity. I think uh, the general brought out brought up how important that is, and I think that's correct. You need different ideas, different thoughts, different behaviours. I was listening to a, a Michael Parkinson interview with Muhammad Ali, um, and it was interesting what Muhammad Ali was saying that you know the same people want to stick together and they only want to live together, which was the thought pattern at that time. But it's, it's the opposite. So I've always tried to pick teams 
based on a, a on a diverse group so we get a mixed thinking which leads to more creativity but one of the things in with different cultures one thing i've always tried to work out and it's not always easy is what's the most important uh, value or behavior for that particular culture and to make sure we don't transgress that and then the rest is non-negotiable you know just a simple example the japan team punctuality is super important you know you go for dinner with japanese at seven o'clock you've got to be there at 6 45 seated you know with australians you get there at 7 15 you know people are looking at you saying you're early um and so we had a situation where we'd have five o'clock uh, team meetings. The Japanese would be there at 4.45 and we'd have five or six New Zealand players and they'd rock in at one to five. So we immediately had a chasm in the team because the Japanese players would all sit at the front and New Zealanders would come at the back. So I had to try to sort that out because that punctuality for Japanese is, is they've been taught that since the age of, of two or three um, to be early. So I wasn't going to change that to them and I wasn't going to change the New Zealanders that they thought that they had to be on time. So we just gave the New Zealanders a different schedule. Um, so their schedule was 15 minutes before, before everyone else. So they both got there at 4.45 and, and immediately we had better connection between the two groups and, we, and that chasm became less because they were sitting with each other and talking to each other. So that's just a very simple example, but it's important to be discerning and finding out what the key value is. So it's a question I'll come back to in a, in a minute once we've finished this, actually, but it's important to understand the context in which you, you're operating and, and culture is absolutely part of that. Um, Stu, can I, can I come to you next uh, uh, for that question, please? Well, it's one of my greatest privileges working at Fulham is to have the diversity of race and uh, ethnicity. And you know, what I think is the privilege for us in our environment is that we don't have to do anything specific that is different. What we have to be is, I think, ourselves. And being ourselves is hopefully preaching a gospel of inclusion. Um, and with all the hatred and all of the, uh, the challenge that our young people find out there, it's, uh, it's, it, it, it's a haven for them to come to the academy and to feel included and to feel part of uh, a, a multinational, multiracial organisation that actually aspires for one thing together. And if I could just uh, uh, allude to a bit of a throwback, when I first came into professional football, it was very, very difficult for black origin players to play for the national English team. And as uh, somebody who has uh, half a foot in the Welsh camp, I wasn't too disappointed in it sometimes with that. But actually, now what I see 15, 20 years down the track is not only uh, young black origin players whose families may be from Africa, but also increasingly we have uh, youngsters of, uh, of, of Muslim origin who aspire to be in the England national team who want to play for the England youth teams, who see their home as being England. And, you know, I, I feel heartened by that. And with all the hatred that we see around the world, I'd like to feel that the next generations are going to sweep that aside in a sporting context and demonstrate that they can actually be united force for good on the pitch as well as off it. Thank you. I, I must be look at, looking at all three organisations that you represent there today. Um, one of the unifying elements of that is that sense of belonging that you've all created and that sense of unified purpose, which is, uh, which is clearly gold dust in, in a time of crisis, absolutely critical. Uh, uh, General, uh, your comments on cross-cultural leadership. I mean, I've got very little to add to what, what Ed and Hugh have said. It's, it's about empathy. It's about understanding your people. Um, I, 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 and I think also it's about enjoying that. You know, particularly within, within our organisation, you, know, you need to enjoy finding out about other cultures and leading a diverse group of people, because there's a richness in that that, that you, we should enjoy. Thanks. Um, I'm gonna go on to a question. There's been a few questions coming in about resilience. Um, I wanna focus on resilience in a minute, uh, both with Hugh and uh, for General Felix, on you as individuals, as individual leaders and how you maintain your own, own resilience. Betty, one from you that's come in, uh, was mental resilience an issue with the players, especially with a six month break in between the six nations? And how did you deal with that? Uh, no, not at all. Um, yeah, we're lucky. We're privileged. You know, you, you look at what's going on in the world at the moment, the suffrage, suffering uh, people out of jobs, 
loss of families. Uh, you know, our guys come in after having a period at home where they could still train and they actually, most of them came back fitter. Um, and it shows you what young people can do by themselves. They all came back fitter um, and now they get this wonderful opportunity to play international rugby. So, yeah, they're absolutely full of beans. Now we've got the next five weeks we're in a bubble in, in Teddington. So that's going to be tested to a, to a large degree, but I think it's a great test for them. And I hope by the end of the five weeks, they've still got a smile on their face. And our job is to make sure that in our environment's stimulating enough to make sure that they do smile. Great. And on to uh, win number four. Thanks, uh, Eddie. Over to uh, uh, the general. I, I wonder if I could just focus on, on you as an individual leader, then, because we spoke a lot about resilience. We focus on resilience of our team, the individuals we lead. But it was mentioned in the, uh, in the uh, early discussions about the leader and leadership starts with the leader. How do you maintain your own resilience when you're under pressure of crisis? Yeah, thanks, Andrew. So, I mean, it's a, it's a really important area and, and one that, that I feel reasonably strongly about. And um, so there's a number of things that I think are really important. And, and the first is, and Lizzie mentioned this, is about delegating and trusting your people. Don't take everything on yourself. You don't need to. Indeed, um, your subordinates will thank you for giving them the space and the freedom to uh, get on with their job. The second thing I'd say is about managing your time to include personal resilience. So make sure that you manage your time effectively and you don't end up spinning from um, before dawn till way late into the night without actually having a period where you can think about personal resilience. And then the third thing I would say is about your fitness. You know, we know that physical fitness helps us be more resilient to the pressures and stress uh, and on a certain environment. But, but more importantly, or just importantly, think about your mental fitness as well. And that's especially important when you are potentially on a, on a long tour, um, taking casualties, working very long hours, sleep deprived. Think about your mental resilience and, and things like, and I don't want to sound too hippie, yoga, meditation, these things that allow you to power down and allow your, your headspace to just power down for a while. And that can reset your balance and perspective in a really healthy way. Um, so um, delegate and trust, manage your time, and then make sure you keep up with your fitness, both mental and physical. Janelle, you know, thanks so much, Hugh. Well, that was a fantastic lesson for me, uh, which the general has just given, so uh, really helpful. And if I just relate it to a personal circumstance, you know, I, I recently did a personality profile and it came up with um, uh, a, a, an analysis of me as, as having a high threshold for dutifulness. And I thought, oh, that's good. Oh, I'm, I'm pleased. And actually, the psychologist I was working alongside at the time said, be careful, because ultimately, if you're spending all of your time believing you're serving others and all of your time actually dedicating to everything else, as opposed to focus on yourself, then it can be a challenge. And one good thing, I think, to come out of this period, we've most of us had a chance, a time to reflect, to think, to spend time away from the battleground, if you like, and to consider our, our sense of purpose. And that's certainly been a case for me. And I've reflected on that a lot as far as dutifulness is concerned. It isn't all about uh, being there. Uh, Eddie made the point about being on the shop floor, and I, I'm sure he's ubiquitous. Uh, in my case, I've had too much of presenteeism and think that in reality, you can be there without being there. And you have to empower and give people the opportunity to carry forward their own roles with your support, which doesn't have to be on their shoulder. And whilst I've never seen myself as uh, an autocrat, certainly that there is benefit in not being present and in ensuring that your dutifulness is to yourself as well as to others. Thank you. Thanks very much. I think there's there's plenty there that resonates. Um, I think as a, a military, we've been guilty in the past of being very uh, mission focused and indeed uh, 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 focusing on other service of others, as the general rightly pointed out, and that, and that maintains and we can't we can't lose sight of that. But I think sometimes it has come at detriment to ourselves as as leaders, which we uh, uh, which we uh, need to maintain focus on. Uh, general, did you did you want to come back on that? Yeah, just just to reinforce one of Hugh's point, points, really. I mean, I think we also need to realize that your own resilience is your duty to your people. 
because you know you can't make good decisions you can't lead them effectively and serve them unless you yourself are in a1 condition so the fact that you're taking an hour out of your day to do something that's about your personal resilience is probably the best thing you can do for the people that you're serving as well as looking after your own health and fitness that's great it's about changing the narrative on that means isn't it thanks general uh, there's a couple of questions come here it come in here about the safe to fail culture as we would understand it in the army and one for Morag, how do you support or help people who make mistakes in high pressure situations in an environment where staff are expected to get things right first time? So how do you enable and, and sustain that safe to fail culture whilst in crisis? Who wants to, who wants to go? I'll throw it out there. General, you look like you're reaching for the button. <laughs> yeah, I don't mind. So, uh, um, and you're asking the right bloke because uh, there's a few people that made more mistakes than me in, a, in my career. I mean, I think, I think it's just, you know, if you don't allow people the freedom to make mistakes, they're never going to do anything for you. They're never going to do and, and um, work for you unless you make it known that you trust them. And if they, if they fail, we all make mistakes. No one is infallible. And, and knowing that means that um, you've got to let people make those mistakes. Um, and the way you encourage them is just by telling them, making sure people know, they feel empowered, they feel trusted. When they mess up, you say, it's okay, you messed up, but it was all for good reason. Learn from that and go on. So, um, and, and we know in the army that we've got more to do to encourage that. Um, and particularly when it comes to reporting and things like that, but we have to get that freedom for people to uh, make mistakes, learn from them and move on. And Eddie, can I, can I throw this one over to you as well? How you encourage that, uh, that culture in, you, in the England team or any other? Yeah. Well, I think that's a hard one. Uh, it's a it's a really difficult one. Um, it's getting the balance right of of guiding the person in the right direction when they've made a mistake. Yeah, sometimes again, it gets back to knowing the person. What do they need? You know, some people just need a soft touch. Some people need a, a harder edge about them. But I think you've always always got to make them understand where is the gap between what they did and what is needed and and ha and allow them to try to solve that problem themselves so how are they going to solve bridging that gap between what they did and what's needed by the team um so that would be the main point for myself thanks eddie and you i guess this is particularly pertinent as you um as you develop young talent through their sort of teenage years and early 20s how do you how do you maintain that with your um, with your youth um, and keeping their focus and when when they when they've failed, whether you encourage failure or actually encourage them back from their own failure? I thought you were going to say it's pertinent because I'm used to losing all the time, which uh, there's no element of truth in that. If you're a, a Fulham fan, you know that you've got to get used to uh, dealing with that disappointment. But uh, one of the things that is a critical focus for us is the development cycle is not all about winning. And for those uh, on, on the call who are parents, you know, we've always been concerned a little bit about the, the football pyramid where there's a win at cost all culture amongst youth. And we have to challenge that wherever we go. Losing is actually a good thing for young people. So they understand the emotion and they understand they don't like the emotion and they understand how to learn from it. I'm always perturbed by teams that have you know, gone through the whole season, winning every game, scoring 150 goals uh, and, and so on. Because it's out of the experience of winning and losing that we grow and how we find what ultimately is required for when we're in that final combat for whether it be a, a warfare arena or whether it be a, a World Cup arena. Uh, how you can draw upon your experiences that you've had as a young player Many a time I've seen those really successful youngsters who've breezed through their early careers all of a sudden come up against a hurdle in their lives at 16, 17, at 20, 22, and not be able to get over it and, and not actually find success. And equally, those who've been slow burners, who've managed to continue to go through their careers and, uh, and keep getting over each hurdle, maybe only just at times, but go on to sustain themselves and have and have great success as a result. Gareth Bale is a classic example of, of that, incidentally. Thank you. Um, there's a question going to come straight back to you, Hugh. It's coming from uh, from the audience, and it's about uh, what do you think the Premiership League could do 
or how much more they could do for grassroots level football. Um, I'll throw the same question over to you, Eddie, if I may, conscious that Bill Sweeney's on later on, so you may be able to give him some advice. Uh, but um, I, I guess it's, this is uh, maybe perhaps from a military perspective is what more we can do uh, developing the, our, our younger leaders as they, as they come through into our organisation. So uh, Hugh, if I can uh, start with you first. I was really privileged to work at the Premier League with Richard Scudamore, an absolutely brilliant executive. And he was really proud that when he joined the Premier League, it turned over 120 million. And 10 years later, they were giving 120 million away to good football causes. The biggest challenge the Premier League has is not being able to promote its good works uh, successfully. And Richard Masters, who, who leads the, the programme now, is, I know, very conscious of ensuring that, it, that as many people as possible understand all the good works the Premier League does. Unfortunately, when you see the levels of wages that are afforded to the highest earners, it's inevitable that there is criticism that comes towards the Premier League, which I have to say has been one of the most successful sports products um, that this country has, has ever fostered. And having worked at the league, I, I am conscious of the weaknesses and the challenges it faces, and sometimes its PR needs to improve. But, you know, it does do a huge amount of good work. If I highlight one of that, uh, the work with the Kicks programme, which initially in association with, um, with the police, uh, does a huge amount of good in keeping youngsters off, off the streets and out of crime. But how many people know about that project? How many people know uh, the success that, um, that, that it's engendered in lowering crime and actually giving opportunities for players to go and to, uh, and to play at a high level? So, uh, and I noticed with Baroness Sue, Sue Campbell on, on the call from the FA, that the challenge for football governance is to promote its, its, its good works and to overcome that difficulty of perception. If there were one thing that I would, would urge uh, to happen from here on in is to try to create a charter between uh, the two leagues and the FA on uh, ring fencing a fund for, uh, for grassroots development upwards. And, and that would be uh, separated from each of the organisations. The Football Foundation does great work, but actually having a, a separate organisation specifically for funding good work in youth. Thanks, you, uh, Eddie. Can I come over to to you? Um, what what more can the uh, the RFU do to support grassroots rugby? I think Bill does a great job, uh, so I'm going to say that. I'm going to say that with him on the call, don't I? No, but he does. And I think uh, the the RFU do a really good job with grassroots rugby. But basically, what what is grassroots sport about? It's about enjoyment. How do you get kids to enjoy the game? They need to have great skills. They need they have a good attitude towards the game. Um, they need to have good facilities. And one of the, the most important things, and I'm sure it's the same in the army, you know, how do you bring good young soldiers through? You've got to have great coaches, well-educated coaches. You can never spend enough money or resources or time on producing good coaches. And that's, that's the main thing that's, that's got to be done. Thanks, Eddie. Um, General, could I come over to you and sort of frame it in, in, in the context of how we, as Eddie sort of alluded to there, how we nurture the talent of our, of our young soldiers? Yeah, I, well, I, I mean, I guess I, I'd say give them time. Give them time, uh, particularly at the lowest level, give l young leaders time leading their soldiers and, uh, uh, and some mentorship, some training, absolutely, but they just need time doing it, making the mistakes and sort of finding out what works and what doesn't. Um, and uh, you know, I, I know more about the US military more than I do uh, the UK, perversely. And one of the challenges they have is uh, junior leaders simply don't have enough time doing simple leadership tasks because they're bogged down with other stuff. So um, give them time. Thanks, General. Uh, I wonder if I we'll come on to a question about communication. Um, it, it's, it's a theme that consistently comes up in and out of uh, 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 crisis when you're talking about leadership. And, uh, and all of you and the previous panelists have spoken about it today. Um, and in this, in this age of, as previously discussed, disinformation, 24 hour news, social media, how do, you, how do you ensure that your message, your narrative is getting through to the people that you want to influence, whether it be those you're leading or coaching, or indeed those you need to influence uh, up the chain of command, so to speak? Who'd like to, to lead on that question? Pause, pause for some thinking time. I got it. I got it, Lane. I'll, uh, 
Actually, yeah. So, so I think, um, I mean, there's a great military mnemonic that, that we know, which is KISS. Keep it simple, stupid. So point one is, is get your message boiled down to something that can be understood, even by officers like me. Um, because there's so much information out there. You've got to just have something that is really easy to assimilate and understand. Um, and that, that goes for anything you're trying to push through a very, very hectic information environment. It's got to be succinct and clear um, in order for people to digest it and want to read it. Um, so that would be my message, KISS. We all learn that at Santos, don't we? Absolutely. It resonates with the message earlier on as well, didn't it? In terms of um, clear message, consistently, uh, consistently delivered. Um, Hugh, can I come to you on that one, please? Yeah, a couple of things, Langley, that come to mind. You know, it's, it's, it's sell, not tell, in my mind. You have to take your colleagues with you. You have to take um, the young, young people with you. They have to believe in the message uh, that, that you're giving. And language is so important. I don't know about you, but I, I'm appalled at the moment in the way in which you listen to some ministers in particular who constantly say, I'm doing this, I'm doing that. Uh, and it, that, that whole notion of I, it's not, it's we, it's together. And if you're going to actually deal with a crisis properly, then you have to take the, the nation with you, as opposed to telling them what you've been doing and how you are going to solve this crisis. We're in it together. Thanks, you. And Eddie, I think you're, you're pretty good at handling the media and um, maintaining your message through them and indeed others. And um, what top tips have you got for, for keeping focus on your, on your narrative? <laughs> I don't know about that, but anyway, uh, well, I think the best example lately has been the New York governor uh, during the first lockdown. He was absolutely brilliant, empathetic, informative, used uh, a display to, to reinforce his language. And I think you've, you've got to keep it simple, as, as the general said. Uh, you've got to keep it contextual so, that, so it really resonates with what you're doing at that time. And, you, and you've got to make it, for young people today, you've got to make it exciting. And you've got to keep the same message, but you've got to say it in a number of different ways. So sometimes put some tomato sauce on it, sometimes put some soya sauce, but the same message, but you've got to find a way to make it exciting. Eddie, thanks very much. On the tomato sauce and soya sauce, I'm going to, um, I'm going to close it there. Conscious of uh, time, we're going to take a couple of minutes uh, of break. But I'd I just like to say sincere thanks to General Felix, to, um, to Eddie Jones and Hugh Jennings for your time and your insight today. Really, really appreciate it. Had a serve. So thank you on behalf of the CAL, the FLS, and indeed the audience. Plenty to, um, to read back on there, but I'll do that at the end. I wish you all, uh, all a, a safe future and the best of luck with your, your teams.